Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, can we stand on our feet and worship God together? Lord God, we are here for you, Lord God. We want you to invade our space this morning. We want you to have your way this morning. Come on, clap your hands like this. Oh, Everything 
here for you. We don't want anything else. We're here for you. We don't want anything else. We're here for you. Take everything away. We're here for you. Regulate our minds. We're here for you. We're here for you. Lord God, I pray that you have your way in this place, in this moment, God. I pray that you reign. Lord God, I pray that you do what only you can do, Lord God. I pray that um, you regulate our minds, oh God. Lord God, that you stir something up in our spirits today, Lord God. I pray that you stir up joy, God. That you stir up peace, oh God. Everlasting joy, God. Everlasting peace, Lord God. Peace that is unexplainable, God. I pray that you have your way. And, Lord God, that every bit of anxiety, every bit of depression as we worship you, Lord God, will begin to fade away even now, God. Have your way in this moment. Have your way in this space. Jesus, the only one. 
want to be filled by your Jesus. For this song. Stirring in your sons and daughters, earth revealing heaven's wonder. Spirit, come, Spirit, come. What you spoke is now unfolding. All your children shall be holy. Dreams awaken in this moment. Spirit come, Spirit come. Pour it out. Let your love run. Glory fill this house. Pour it out, pour it out. Let your love run over. Hear it now. Let your glory fill this house. Now the world awaits your promise. His power is within us. We will rise to be your image. Spirit come, Spirit come, yeah. Pour it out, let your love run.
God, I pray that you fill us today. Lord God, I pray that you fill us with your joy, God. For the joy of the Lord is our strength, oh God. Lord God, I pray that you fill us with strength that will never run empty. Lord God, as we travel through this school a semester, oh God, I pray that you give us uh, joy, God, in a place for anxiety and depression, Lord God. Give us peace in the midst of our storms, God, when we feel like we can't make it, oh God. Lord God, I pray that you instill peace in us, Lord God, that you regulate our mind, oh God. Lord God, that you would give us a warrior mentality, oh God, that we, we are able to make it, Lord God, that we have that breastplate of righteousness, oh God. Lord God, fill us today. Fill us like never before. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, guys.
was absolutely wonderful. Good morning. Well, my name is Diane Chen, and I teach New Testament at Palmer Seminary, where every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 p.m., we have something called Chapel and Chew. Worship, food, and conversation out of the heart of the community life at the seminary. So anyone passing by the second floor of McInnes during that time is welcome to join us. So come by for a free dinner sometime. Let's start with a no-brainer. Food is a necessity. We must eat to stay alive. For most of us, eating is generally a positive physical experience. We may not like all foods, but we usually can name some favorites. Most of us experience eating also as a positive social experience. When we say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, we are saying the last thing we want to do before we kick the bucket is to have a jolly old time. And a jolly old time involves eating and drinking. Yet, sin can turn every good gift that comes from God into something harmful. For example, it's good to have a strong work ethic, but if we overdo it, workaholism hurts us and those around us, especially when it is fueled by pride, insecurity, and competitiveness. Likewise, eating is a gift, but gluttony is a distortion of what it meant, what it's meant to be enjoyable and life-sustaining into a deadly vice. When we overeat, something has gone out of control. Perhaps within us, something needs attention, but we use food to make us feel good so we won't have to face the real problem underneath. Now, before I go further, I want to mention two things. First, beware of false stereotypes. Not everyone who is overweight or obese is greedy and gluttonous because not all weight gain has to do with a lack of self-control. There are other reasons behind obesity, such as medical, genetic, and economic factors. Some medications have side effects that make people gain weight. Some people live in food deserts where they don't have access to affordable whole foods, so they end up eating processed food junk food, and fast foods that are cheap and filling. Societal messages underscore the negative stereotype and promote fat shaming. Advertisers say, thin is beautiful, thin is in. But remember that eating disorders can go in both directions, eating too much or eating too little are both detrimental. So when we think about gluttony, let's do so without judging or imposing a guilt trip on others and on ourselves. In the final analysis, as a vice, gluttony is no respecter of BMIs. As long as we eat, the temptation of gluttony lurks in the background. Second, neither are we talking today about people who suffer from starvation or hunger. That would call for a different sermon on justice and generosity. Rather, gluttony is an excessive obsession with food for self-gratification when food is abundant, when there is plenty to eat and we let loose completely with what we eat, how much we eat, and why we eat. The title of this series is 
glittering vices, which implies that something bad, a vice, is dressed up as something attractive, glittering, and alluring. A vice is a learned behavior so that we acquire a bad habit. The more we do it, the more it becomes second nature. So the more we eat excessively, the bigger we stretch our stomachs, the more we don't think twice about stuffing our faces. But bad habits can be broken. We do not have to succumb to the downward spiral. People quit smoking, drinking, and gambling. It's hard to do, but it's not impossible. Acknowledging what gluttony can do or is doing to us is the first step to disarm its power over us. Speaking of power, on a deeper level, a vice is more serious than a bad habit. It is a sinful power that controls and imprisons us. This tool is a vice. You put a piece of wood between the jaws and crank the handle. When the jaws come together, they keep the lock from moving. By the same token, gluttony is a vice that has the power to control us. And it does so bit by bit, one eating opportunity at a time. By the time gluttony has us in its grip, we are dealing with an addiction of sorts. So in spite of its necessity, food has become so much of a priority that it colors our attitudes, preoccupations, decisions, and actions in life-diminishing ways. When gluttony is exposed as a deadly sin, then the issue is not just about our physical well-being. Our body, soul, mind, and spirit are not four compartmentalized boxes. God created us as whole persons, so we need to consider the effect that our food consumption has on our emotional, social, and spiritual well-being as well. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul speaks of slave as a, a sorry, speak of sin as a slave master. All, both Jews and Greek, are under the power of sin. Hence, his exhortation, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Sin is like a vice, controlling us so that we cannot save ourselves from its grip. So the way to freedom is not by our good intentions and willpower, but by God's power that is greater than the power of sin. Seen in this light, gluttony is a spiritual battle that needs a spiritual solution. We will get to that in a bit. But first this, how is gluttony a glittering vice that beckons us with its bells and whistles? To state the obvious, eating is pleasurable. After all, I'm Chinese, we love to eat. God made food tasty so that we will eat and stay alive. But physical needs aside, food also fulfills a social and emotional need. We celebrate happy occasions, birthdays, graduations, weddings, and holidays with lots of good food. We remember the taste, the smell, the laughter long after everything is digested. Sometimes when we eat with others, the company and the conversation can be more memorable than the food itself. And for some of us, when we feel sad, alone, or depressed, we too look for food for comfort. So the line between eating adequately and eating excessively is not difficult to cross. Probably, 
We have all crossed the line here and there in eating too much over the holidays. But if we cross the line too often without giving it any thought, we are forming a bad habit and positioning ourselves within the jaws of that vice of gluttony. That by the time we realize we have a problem, the problem has already locked us in. Because gluttony looks harmless in the beginning, since we're just eating, we can justify ourselves pretty easily. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet. I need to get my money's worth. I'm so full, but let me finish that. I don't want to waste food. I feel good when I eat. I am practicing self-care. Well, not being hungry, it is a good thing. That's why we eat. But why do we eat much more than our body requires? Does our undisciplined behavior signal something else that needs attention? Meet Joey Chestnut. He is 36 years old, and he holds 53 different food eating records. Among his achievements, he has eaten 121 Twinkies in six minutes, 141 hard boiled eggs in eight minutes, 74 hot dogs with buns in 10 minutes, and 182 chicken wings in half an hour. Competitive eaters eat not because they are hungry, but to prove they're number one. But does calling this a sport make it any less gluttonous? I doubt if eating 141 eggs in one sitting is good for anyone's body, not to mention the practice rounds before the competition. Yet the website Major League Eating, MLE, calls Joey Chestnut an American hero and a national treasure because his appetite is legendary. The glorification of gluttony. The void within us is not always physical. It may be emotional, social, or spiritual. Some of us stuff ourselves with comfort food to numb our troubled spirits. Others like to be called a foodie because the label implies sophistication, which we think will elevate the way others think of us. Eating becomes an experience. We fuss about taste and ambiance, qualities and ratings, when the money we splurge on fine dining might have been put to better use. Or, whether we realize it or not, some of us operate out of a theology of scarcity and exhibit the FOMO syndrome, the fear of missing out, grabbing what we can as much as we can before anyone else could get to it. We use food to address voids in us that are not merely physical, as in hunger. But can food solve these problems, or it actually makes them worse? In moderation and balance, food brings health and pleasure. Food makes life delightful. But the problem is when we go from eating enough to eating too much. When craving turns into obsession and obsessions into addiction, and then we find ourselves at the mercy of gluttony. So what do we do? Some people may say, if overeating is a vice, let's fast. I would caution against going from one extreme to another too quickly and drastically, lest your body go into shock. That said, fasting is a spiritual discipline provided that it's practiced with proper guidance and not at the expense of one's health. 
Sometimes it takes an internal removal, oh sorry, intentional, not internal, intentional removal of food for us to realize how strong a hold it has on us. And when fasting is coupled with prayer and reading of scripture, we make ourselves available to hear what God wants to say to us. Perhaps we then get to the root problem behind our overeating habits. But please don't fast simply as a knee-jerk reaction against gluttony. If we eat too much for the wrong reasons, we can also eat too little or not at all for the wrong reasons. A more lasting solution begins with acknowledging that we need help from God. If we don't have the discipline to curb our appetites in the first place, what makes us think that we can, by some wimpy willpower, extricate ourselves after we've gone down the slippery slope? When we find ourselves overly preoccupied with what we eat and how we eat, we are waging a spiritual battle on the physical battleground of our body. We need a stronger power to break that grip of the vice of gluttony, and we need the power of the Holy Spirit. God may send friends, family members, prayer partners, counselors, nutritionists, and other medical resources to help us, but we have to be willing to receive the help, and that takes humility. I will close with an excerpt from a piece of Jewish wisdom literature called Sirach, written about two centuries before Jesus. While this document is not a part of our Protestant Bible, both the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church accept it as part of their biblical canon. The author, Ben Syra, has some wise words to say about not only what we eat, but how we eat. So here it is from Sirach 31. Are you seated at the table of the great? Do not be greedy at it, and do not say, ooh, how much food there is here. Remember that a greedy eye is a bad thing. Do not reach out your hand for everything you see, and do not crowd your neighbor at the dish. Judge your neighbor's feelings by your own, and in every matter, be thoughtful. Eat what is set before you like a well-brought-up person, and do not chew, chew greedily, for you will give offense. Be the first to stop as befits good manners, and do not be insatiable, for you will give offense. If you are seated among many persons, do not help yourself before they do. How ample a little is for a well-disciplined person. Food is God's gift to us for our health and enjoyment. May the Lord help us keep it that way and deliver us when our impulses get the better of us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, if we are honest, many of us could use a closer look at our relationship with food. We confess that sometimes we eat too much, sometimes we don't eat enough, or we eat for the wrong reasons. We want to honor you with how we treat our bodies. Please make us aware of our bad eating habits and help us move toward a healthy balance by connecting us with the right people for counsel, for accountability, and support. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I guess chapel ended early today. So God bless you, and you're dismissed. <laughs>